welcome in our first guest of the day, Delegate Michael Heights, who's calling in live from interims in Charleston. Good morning, Mike. How are you, sir? Good morning. Good to be here. <laughs> good, good morning, Mike. We'll fill in the <laughs> the gap of silence. <laughs> great, well, great to yeah, have I don't you too. Want to talk too much. I mean, Bill, Bill sounds pretty aggressive right now about the Yellow Jackets. Uh, oh yeah. Like, Got to keep him calm. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 Mike, you have great skills of keeping somebody calm. The badger at his best. <laughs> That's correct. Just send him, send him through a TSA checkpoint and just watch the calmness come out. That's exactly right. <laughs> so I got, yeah. a, I got a motivated admiral and a cranky delegate I'm dealing with here this morning. <laughs> well, it's better that way than the other way around. Maybe because, you're right. Because the cranky That's delegate's true. not in the studio. Uh, Mike, tell me, what is what is LACRA? And, uh, and and what do you do there? And the, what are the committee meetings covering right now? Well, LACRA is a legislative oversight uh, committee on on health and human resources, um, and it's made up of uh, about four or five delegates, four or five uh, senators, um, and we meet and and um, like I said, it's a legislative oversight. We talk about the the problems that are going on with any of the. Uh, the health services um, or health, uh, uh, anything in DHHR. Mm -hmm. All right. So obviously we know what some of the big things are right now, uh, and and that includes uh, situations uh, in the Eastern Panhandle involving a large backup of court cases that are going through the system uh, with kids who need attention here. Can you tell us what kind of progress we're making there, if any? Well, we did we did listen to some reports on uh, the CPS problems, um, and particularly the you know the CPS workers and the shortage. Um, and it's like many things when you have shortages in in individuals. Um, is what's the solution? And you know most people jump to uh, you know pay. Is it is it about money? And usually there's there's other factors it's not just money um there's a lot of different factors so you know we we try to come to a conclusion of what those different factors are and how do you solve the whole problem rather than just throw money at a situation um and hope it goes away um now that's not to say that that money isn't part of the problem because a lot of times it is you know you got to have uh cps workers have to have competitive pay with uh, our surrounding states or obviously it's just like teachers or anything else um, you know they're going to go across the borders so um, we, we talked a little bit about that um, the uh, there was a presentation um, about the different solutions that uh, that they have um, so it, right now it's about implementing those the ones that we feel like uh, are a good idea and, and going going forward with them did you get a chance to uh, hear the Judge Steve Redding uh, testimony? No, I did not. Have, have you? Are you, are you familiar with it at all? No. Okay. No. There, there was a, a situation. I think you said four hundred cases backed up in the Eastern Panhandle, and uh, caseworkers who have a caseload of one hundred and twenty-five to one hundred and thirty cases, when twenty-five to thirty would be the normal caseload. And that, that kind of gets back to the money can solve some problems, but but not all. Uh, you you have to find people who are willing to be uh, employees of DHHR and take on caseloads first. Uh, but when you have them, obviously you have to pay them enough to make it worth their while. Uh, we had uh, a person in yesterday on the program who was discussing formally uh, what her career was in a different state. And she had mentioned the fact that it is. It was Katie Morgan, who's the recovery services coordinator in Berkeley County, but previously worked in sure. child protective services in Virginia. And she said it's it's a forty hour pay week, but it's really an eighty hour week if you're doing if you're doing your job properly. It's about eighty hours, and you get burned out quickly. So if the salary isn't worth the time and effort of the stress of going through that job, you, you turn people over pretty quickly. I, yeah, absolutely, and and. I absolutely agree that we need to look at salaries and and they need to be commensurate and and you know if if we hire more people then maybe that that isn't an 80 hour work week because 
your your workload goes down some because it's it's spread out over more people. So that is absolutely one of the the areas we need to look at. But we you know we have another. I heard another report in Locker as well about uh, forensic pathologists. We have we have a backlog of of uh, doing autopsies in the state of West Virginia as well, and we just don't have enough uh, forensic pathologists and. And, you know, they said we have six of them here in West Virginia. We need about 12 or 13. And, and again, we, we brought up, you know, is this a pay issue? And, and I was surprised to find out that the average pay for a forensic pathologist is somewhere in the, the $125,000 to $130,000 a year range. And West Virginia pays two fifty. Um, so and, and leads the nation in – forensic pathology pay so it's it's not that's why i'm saying it's it's not always about pay Mm -hmm. you can pay more and and maybe that'll help you know some of the overlying situations but if if there's a nationwide shortage of these individuals and you just don't have them going into that field um to get the education to do this kind of work then you know Pay's not going to solve the situation. There has to be a a, uh, a concerted effort to recruit individuals at the education level for these fields. Um, you know, at at WVU or Marshall or even Shepherd, um, for for the state to go into these schools and and talk to students and say. There is a shortage in these areas, um, and and we need you to consider this. Billy? Yeah. Uh, good morning, Mike. Uh, good morning. Hoppy Kirchival uh, yesterday on Metro News wrote an article that I felt to be somewhat in the uh, – uh, quite critical of uh, of DHHR. Uh, What he's saying is that West Virginia Code 49-5-101 prohibits the uh, Department of Health and Human Service uh, providing information on children. And everybody kind of accepts that. But Kirchhoff went went farther, said that uh, in his view, DHHR is using that uh, prohibition, uh, which is intended to protect children, but that's using to protect the agency from public discussion. Disclosure. In other words, what he's saying is that the agency is not telling the public all it should tell. Uh, did that come out with the Amy Summers uh, hearing yesterday? Uh, yeah, and, and actually, uh, Delegate Summers did address that and and even spoke to um, possible legislation that would change that, um, especially as it results not not just to uh, the public in general, but more specifically to um, you know, the education department, that there's not um, a collaboration between DHHR and the education department so that educators are aware when when these children are in crisis and uh, maybe in, in foster care or going through something um, of that nature. It's important for the, the schools to know as well um, so that you know they can they can handle things a little differently and and be aware that those children are are in crisis so there is a concerted effort to try to change that law and you know protect the the uh the information of the child at the same time so um there are efforts to correct that. One of the witnesses yesterday, I believe, was the incoming secretary for the Department of uh, uh, Health and Human Service or Department of Human Services. Uh, did you have a opportunity to listen to her, and what was your opinion of this incoming secretary? Uh, yeah, I've heard um, from all three of them, um, um, and and. I would say they, that all three seem pretty impressive. Um, they seem to be on top of their game. They seem to be excited about trying to um, make things better within their uh, particular uh, department. Um, if, if I had um, any reservations about any of the three, it, it was probably uh, Secretary Caruso, who's uh, going to be over facilities, um and yeah my only 
issue with him, and and I I told him during the meeting was his his org chart um, that it, in his org chart that he has himself, and then below him he has um, a COO, and um, beside the COO a strategist, um, and then people below that, and I told him I have some concerns about you know departments being top heavy. And I'm not sure I don't I understand why a a secretary of a department um, at the secretary level isn't their own COO and their own strategist. Why the heck they need uh, two other people to do their job for them? Um, I wasn't real happy with his org chart. So, um, you know, the other two I'm, I would say I'm real happy with. I see um, some some positive changes there. Um, him, I think maybe. Maybe he'll come around. I'm hoping. <laughs> uh, where where do these folks come from? Are they for all part of DHHR? Are they from academia? Are they from industry? Are they out of state? Uh, where are they, where are they coming from, Mike? Um, you know, I, I'll be honest with you. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if they were hired from within. I don't think so. Um, uh, but they're all three of them are doctors. So um, I would say, you know probably working in the field already if not in west virginia then um in another state uh, let me kind of go back full circle with my first question the uh, uh secretary sure. of department of human services uh, uh personally i think the way you pronounce the name uh yeah. did, did she come across as being uh uh recognizing the criticism that had been levied that the department has been fairly uh uh fairly opaque as far as what they're trying to do um i would say yes um she is i I think she's trying to make changes there um and is uh, she seems excited about it she seems very organized um and she recognizes that there's some problems and have been problems in the past and uh, it, it at least seems to me like she's moving in a direction to make those changes and, and make it a whole lot more transparent. Um, you know, but sometimes you wonder when you're in these uh, meetings whether this is lip service or whether this is going to actually happen. So, you know, it remains to be seen at this point. Uh, refresh me, uh, Mike. Uh, the hiring process was done uh, within the governor's office. Is that correct? Or by, I'm sorry, you uh, broke up a little bit there. Okay. What was it? The, uh, the hiring process was done by the governor's office. The legislators had no input whatsoever. Is that correct? Yeah, that that is correct. We we didn't know until until it happened who, okay. who the, the individuals were. So you'll be in a position to evaluate after the fact if a good hire was made. So. And right, no, we wouldn't we wouldn't have any any oversight over that at, at all. Um, we find out after the fact and find out what their credentials and everything are. Um, and, and then our first interaction with them is, is usually within these meetings. Mike, what are the meetings? You know, I, say, I say our, when I say our interaction, it would be the members of Locker. And now the, the uh, department heads, uh, the health care um, of both the Senate and the House, um, have had uh, individual meetings with these individuals um, before us. So th- there's some interaction there. What other meetings are you addressing while you're at these interim sessions, Mike? Um, well, those were the big ones. I also had uh, technology and infrastructure um, meetings, and um, that one was basically about, you know, um, trying to get – um, legislation together early on so it can all be presented at early in session um, rather than, you know, trying to to uh, start legislation once you get there. So uh, a lot of that was administrative. What wasn't, we heard some um, testimony about fire hydrants. There, there Apparently there was a, a fire um, – sometime this past year where a hydrant didn't work and um the governor sort of put it on um the pcs and and you know whomever and said you know the legislature you know 
find, find out who's in charge of this and get it fixed. And what we found out that is that fire hydrants, believe it or not, don't come under anybody's jurisdiction. Um, the testing or, or repair, replacement, um, nobody seems to be in charge of that. So uh, Public Service Commission sort of took it under their own wing and, and did some studies on it and surveys and um, to try to find out uh, what the status of fire hydrants in West Virginia is. And, um, you know, there, so right now we have no standards. There's no no requirements for testing. Um, you can have a fire hydrant outside of your home, and it looks pretty, but there's no guarantee that it's going to work. So um, we're trying to put some, together some legislation to uh, to make that happen, to give some authority to the PCS to regulate that. And it seems like the fire hydrants sort of fall under the um, the responsibility of the individual water departments within any given area. Um, that it's sort of on them to make sure that these uh, these fire hydrants work and work properly. Mike, I'm a little surprised with that. From my experience working with the uh, uh, Berkeley County Water District, uh, there was a very rigorous uh, testing of fire hydrants. I think they all had to be tested at least twice a year. Uh, each one of them were manually open and the flow was was monitored. Uh, so I'm uh, that may have been something that the the local utility did. On their own, more credit to them. But I thought they were responding to the Public Service Commission. Well, no, that that's exactly what it was, Bill. It was the, uh, our local um, public service uh, water utility here in Berkeley County um, was responsible and took it upon themselves to do that. That was their own policy. There is no statewide policy, and, and there was nothing that says they had to do that. Um, now, there is a national standard, but West Virginia has not adopted the national standard. Uh, I'm glad that, that Berkeley County's public service district has. Um, and so I think that the national standard is you have to um, test for functionality once a year um, and then do an actual flow test every three to five years. Um, so that's the national standard, and I think that's what's going to happen. I think the, there's going to be legislation passed to adopt the national standard and uh, try to get these going. Some of the problems that they testified that, that might be a problem is a lot of these public service districts are rather small, and they just don't have the funding to replace them if they're not working properly. Um, or do the major upgrades if the flows um, aren't what they should be. So, um, you know, uh, once again, the state may have to find money to, uh, to rectify that situation, or there could be rate increases for some areas. Yeah. I was also surprised to find out that, you know, the, the average life of a fire hydrant is, is between 50 and a hundred years. Um, and, the the oldest one in West Virginia <clears throat> right now is 138 years old. So some of them obviously need to be replaced as well. Yeah, uh, kind of a related issue with that is that the uh, hydrant uh, the hydrants are supplied by very old piping, and a lot of that piping yeah. started leaking. I uh, I remember a number of uh, as much as 40, 45 percent of war all the water was being lost just by leaking. So I know that Berkeley County made a methodical, a very uh, a very directed study trying to replace as much of the pipes as they could. So I'm sure the smaller yeah. districts have this uh, even more of a problem. Yeah, absolutely. And um, you can you can just imagine what it would cost to make replacements and repairs to um, you know these systems, um, and to do it in some place like Berkeley County, where we're you know we're an affluent county, we we have a little bit of money as compared to the other counties in West Virginia. But if you go to some place like, you know, McDowell County, you know, they, they can't afford to, to replace fire hydrants in, in McDowell County right now. There would, uh, there would have to be some kind of system where there were grants or something to, uh, to assist them to get their, their uh, systems up to par. Mike, when do you uh, get to leave Charleston? 
Uh, actually, I have left Charleston. My last meeting was yesterday. Um, I headed back. Uh, I got here late last night, back to uh, Berkeley County. Oh, very nice. I didn't know. I thought you were yeah. still still at the at the home there. Nope, nope. Um, I I had only I only had meetings on Monday and Tuesday, but they they happened to pack it in there pretty tight. So I was pretty busy Monday and Tuesday, um, and then so. Since I got out at a decent hour on Tuesday, uh, I decided to head back. You were on the Finance Committee as well, and uh, through the first three months of the fiscal year, it's a uh, $200 million surplus uh, that the state has on the pace for 900 something million if uh, all the quarters worked out the same way. Uh, your thoughts on a potential 10% trigger being met for another income tax cut? Uh, I think it absolutely could be. Um, and, and here's the, the interesting thing. You know, we gave a 21% uh, 21 and a couple pennies or whatever percent um, decrease in personal income tax. And yet our personal income tax revenue is, is about the same as it was um, for this point last year. So, um, you know, that, that seems to be working. Um and and maybe it's because of the the increase in, in jobs in West Virginia. I, I think that's playing a big factor. But um, you know that's the reason the triggers were put in there. That as as our economy grows, as uh, more and more jobs come to West Virginia, um, you know the triggers are there, so we don't have to keep going back and passing new legislation to uh, to give the people of West Virginia some of their money back. Berkeley. So, you know, I'm looking forward to an, another 10 percent coming off. Berkeley County Commissioner Steve Catlett was on yesterday and once again made a case for getting home rule in the counties and giving the counties the freedom if uh, if they had the option of passing the, a 1 percent sales tax increase. Mike, do you see any appetite at all in the legislature for allowing that to happen? Well, I, I've written that bill. You know, I talked to Steve and a bunch of them. Um, that's one of the first bills I wrote um, this sort of off session. Um, I've already submitted it to um, to bill drafting. It, it's right now. It, it's going to be a bill, um, and you know, I hope there is because you know we talk about local control a lot, and and the way the I wrote the bill, that's exactly what it does. It it's 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 permissive it's not mandatory it it allows county by county to decide whether or not they want home rule and whether or not they want um a one percent sales tax in their area so you know if if wyoming county doesn't want it they don't have to have it if berkeley county does want it then then the people get to decide through a, a referendum that's the way the bill's written um as far as it goes in 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 berkeley county well in all counties but it's also written into the the bill that um if you choose home rule in your county um and the one percent sales tax in your county that the county must eliminate the the stormwater management fee um that they can't have both so um, I put that in the bill as well, hoping to that if if, if Berkeley Countyans decide that they want home rule and, and they're okay with the one percent sales tax, um, that they're also eliminating the stormwater management fee at the same time. Which I believe Berkeley County is the only one with stormwater management fee. I believe I'm right. Uh, uh, that is true, but yeah. it also has a provision in there that if there would be in the future, um, it. You couldn't institute a a stormwater management fee if you have home rule. Okay. Mike, I was uh, uh, Steve Catlin made the point yesterday that I was surprised to hear. He said he felt that most all the counties were supportive of home rule. Uh, I remember years ago I was told by some of the delegates at the time that only a few counties wanted home rule. They wanted the responsibility to stay with the legislators. But that's but evidently there's a change, or Steve's reading it different. That most of the counties would like to see home rule. Um, you know, I think some counties are looking at, you know, they need additional funding, they need an, a new additional revenue generation, and this could be a way to do it. Um, I don't, 
I don't know that all counties are going to want this. There's going to be some counties where, you know, sales tax, there's just not enough sales generated in their particular county to, to make it worthwhile. Um, but there's also some poor counties out there that have a, a large tourism um, that could benefit from, from something like this that you, you would think, you know, a sales tax, a 1% sales tax in those counties takes a lot of the burden off of the the individuals um, within that county and puts it on the the tourists. Um, so they end up, you know, the tourists end up paying a, a lot of your your uh, your fee there. So you know, it could benefit them greatly um, for any areas like that, and for pass through counties like Berkeley County, Jefferson County, it could benefit uh, us as well, where you have. Uh, a large uh, population that are just passing through. What about impact fees? Uh, is, does your bill address impact fees? Uh, I, I, well, I wrote another bill um, to to address impact fees, and essentially what that bill does is it just eliminates the verbiage um, in code that says you have to have um, you have to have zoning to have impact fees. So it strikes through the line that refers to zoning, um, which would allow the, the county the county commission um, to institute impact fees. Um, there was, a, you know, I, think, I think Delegate Hornby wanted uh, a similar bill run as well, but I think, I, I don't want to speak for him, but I think his bill sort of took it a step further where he was going to... Um, he was going to dictate what the fee would be. And I would much rather just leave that up to the county commission, in my opinion. Uh, it, it's going to be different from county to county. So um, the impact fee can, can be different from county to county. Delegate Michael Height, thank you so much for your time this morning. Hey, thank you. Thanks, Mike. See you on Friday.